about my faith and worship. I used to worry about the future. But then I threw my caution to the wind. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. This is a fantastic narrative that you'll want to follow along. At One and All Church, uh, right now we have tons of new people finding their way, some back to church, some to church for the first time, and that's typical of when a nation or a world suffers some tragedy. Oftentimes people will spiritually pursue something that they haven't pursued in the past. So I'm, that's good news for all of us, but it's also challenging in the sense that it's important to know what we at One and All Church are really about. I don't know of any other passage in the New Testament that really communicates what it is that God has communicated to us as far as our vision and mission for our church really is. Now, we are your mainline church. We, we believe the Bible is the Word of God and God has chosen to reveal Himself through Scripture. We believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, the only way to salvation because only Christ died for our sins, the very sins that separate us from God. So that gap between us and God has been closed by the cross of Jesus Christ. We also believe in community. We believe in accountability. We believe in pursuing holiness. All of those things are typical of a church that follows the teachings of Jesus Christ. God has given us, I wouldn't say a unique vision, but a vision to reach those who are far from God and to do it with great passion and fervor. And so God showed me years ago in discovering the meaning of this text that he had something very special for one and all church. And I'm not saying that we're the only church he has this for, but I can only be responsible for what God shows me for the church that I'm leading. He's the ultimate leader, and I am his servant. But this is a great passage to illustrate to those who are new to one and all. Maybe you're new to our website, new to our YouTube channel. This is a great opportunity to discover who we are and what we're about. So here's the story. It's Matthew chapter 15. The disciples and Jesus have decided to get away for a little bit of R&R. They've been uh, experiencing ministry. Thousands of people are coming to hear Jesus preach and teach. And in his humanity, there's fatigue setting in. So they decide to leave the region and go up north, which is where you take vacation. And in verse 21, we read that they left that place, that is the place of ministry, and they withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, it's important to know Tyre and Sidon is two Phoenician cities up on the uh, Mediterranean coast. This is, again, where you go for rest and relaxation. However, it's also where a group of people exist that the disciples and the people of Israel believe to be the very bottom of the spiritual barrel. So, yeah, you go here for vacation, good place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. And so the Bible tells us, as soon as they arrived, that a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. So here is a Canaanite. Now, quickly about the Canaanites. When the children of Israel came into the promised land, uh, God directed them to expel all the nations out of that land, not because he hated the people, but because of the idol worship, the the sacrifice of their children on uh, uh, on the altar of Molech. There were atrocities being committed that Quite frankly, we, we didn't see for many, many years after. We are seeing again today, and that's another sermon. But we're, we were seeing things that were just atrocious and uh, abhorrent. They were things that God wanted uh, to extrapolate out of the promised land so that he could train his people, teach his people to be holy in the way that he's holy. And so the Israelites never forgot that the Canaanites, those who were in the land originally, some remained... Uh, some intermarried with Israelites. So the group or the people of of Canaan, the Canaanites there represented in the minds of Israel people who were so far from God that there's no way they could ever be reached. They were just beneath uh, spiritual uh, teaching. You couldn't teach them. Their eyes could not be opened. They were just so far gone. Okay, it's important to remember that. But anyway, this woman comes, and she's a Canaanite woman, And she says, Lord, Kyrios, she refers to Jesus as teacher or master. And she says, son of David. Now that's interesting because that means she has some awareness of 
of Messiah. That's a messianic term. So even though she's a Canaanite, she's either read up or studied or someone's taught her that Jesus is or is claiming to be Messiah and Messiah would have power. She respects him. She says, Lord, son of David. And then she says, have mercy on me because my daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Now, you and I know if we're parents that we would do anything, anything whatsoever to save the lives of our children. And so here is a mother whose heart is significantly wounded by the suffering of her own child. She probably heard that Jesus was coming into town somehow, we don't know, but she did everything she could to get there. And then she comes before Jesus and the disciples and she cries out, Lord, son of David, please help my daughter. Now, in verse 23, we read these words, Jesus, in response to her, did not answer her a word. Now, this doesn't seem to be typical of what Jesus does. Here's somebody that's deeply wounded, somebody that's hurting. And she comes and kneels down before Jesus. Or not, She doesn't kneel yet, but she's approaching Jesus, begging Jesus, Lord, help me. And Jesus, we're told in the text, ignores her, doesn't speak a word. And like I said, there was a, a Samaritan woman that Jesus talked to that wasn't of the house of Israel. There was a Roman centurion that Jesus related to and actually healed his son that wasn't of the house of Israel. But here, Jesus ignores her. And so the next verse says, the disciples came to him and urged him. Now you think these disciples are full of compassion? They come to Jesus and they also beg Jesus, only they beg Jesus to send her away because she keeps crying out after us. So you can tell the disciples haven't learned any lessons about compassion. And they come to Jesus and they say, you know, we're we're here on vacation. You know, we're trying to relax a little bit. Send this Gentile female riffraff away from us. And notice they say she's crying out after us. That's a bit grandiose because she's not crying out for the disciples. She's crying out for Jesus. Verse 24, he answered, I was sent only to the sheep or lost sheep of Israel. Now that's interesting. First he ignores her. The second thing he does basically is say to this woman, I was not sent for your kind. Now, that's offensive. I don't care what culture you're in. And what's really interesting is we just said he spent half a day with a Samaritan woman at a well. He spent a lot of time with with Roman soldiers, with people who were Gentiles. He healed their children, uh, cast out their demons. And so here's a woman who's a mother who's humbled herself, coming to Jesus, and the first thing Jesus does is just ignore her. second thing he does is he says, I wasn't sitting for your kind, sorry. But the woman was not deterred. She came now and she knelt before him. Some translations say worship because the Greek word is proskuneo. So she kneels down, probably kisses Jesus' feet in an act of ultimate respect and also one that a beggar would do. And she says, Lord, help me. Curios, teacher, master, please help me. And in verse 26, he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. So first, He ignores her. Second, he says, I wasn't sent for your kind. And third, he says, I can't give the precious food prepared for the children and give it to the dogs. The greatest insult that you could say to a person in first century Israel was to call them a dog because it represented somebody who was a scavenger who didn't deserve anything of greatness but only what is left over. Now, she replies to that in verse 27. We'll get to that at the end of the sermon. She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat crumbs that fall from the master's table. And if you know the rest of the story, Jesus does move with compassion and heals her daughter. Now, the question is, why would Jesus do something so drastic in Matthew 15 as to ignore this woman and then to say, I wasn't sent for your kind, and then to say, I can't give what is meant for my children, the children of God, to the dogs. Those are three great insults. It took a while for me to understand what's happening here. And there are scholars that have really helped me understand what Jesus is doing. Because Jesus is testing the disciples. And uh, Walter Winkus talks about one of the teaching methods Jesus uses in the New Testament is called deliberately induced frustration. In other words, uh, he knows a storm is coming, and he will put the disciples out on the lake in a boat anyway, or the sea anyway. Uh, He knows there's not enough food to feed 5,000 people, so he looks at Philip and Andrew, and he says, feed these people with 
the small fish and the loaves. So this is deliberately induced frustration to put them in a situation whereby they're going to be forced to open up within their own assumptions and ask significant questions. It's tension. And tension is good because it forces you to think about why you're feeling the way you're feeling and what is it that you must do to gain success. So as Jesus is speaking with the woman, he's testing the disciples. Uh, I think what Jesus is doing here, it's one thing to hold an erroneous theology to yourself, keep it to yourself. It's another thing entirely to speak it out loud and hear the thoughts, the words behind what you say you believe. So when Jesus starts to interact with this Canaanite woman, Jesus is hoping that at every stage the disciples will interrupt and say, well, wait a minute, Jesus, you, we shouldn't treat this woman this way. I mean, I know she's not of Israel. I know she's not of the house of Israel. I think Jesus is hoping that when he ignores her, the disciples would come and say, Jesus, this woman is hurting. Can't you tell? Can't you see this? Aren't you going to help? But they don't. They say, send her away. Jesus, we don't have time for any Gentile female riffraff. Send her away. But Jesus doesn't send her away. And then he says, I was only sent for the lost sheep of Israel, hoping that the disciples would say, wait a minute, we've seen you in action. You're not only sent for the house of Israel, the sheep of Israel, we've seen you, the house of Israel, we've seen you minister to all kinds of people across the spectrum. In fact, you told a Roman centurion that when the end of time comes, the culmination of the age, the consummation rather of the age, you said that there will be people from the east and the west around the great banquet table of God. The west representing The people who are barbaric, the people who we see as far from God. So how can you say you're not sent for the, you were only sent for the house of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel? But nobody comes forward. Nobody defends the woman. And then finally, he packs a powerful punch when he says, and it's not good to give what is meant for the children to the dogs. Now, he's hoping, I believe, that one of the disciples would come forward and say, wait a minute, is it really necessary? Okay, you don't have to help her. You can ignore her. You can remind her that you weren't sent for her kind, but... Is it really necessary to refer to her as a dog? He's hoping that the disciples, one of them, will step forward and say, look, this is not appropriate. You've taught us a different method, a different way, and now you're contradicting that. Every good teacher knows that you can just simply dispense information, but a far greater method of teaching is to put your students in a position, in a setting where they'll be forced to really open up within their own assumptions. That is the greatest teaching method. Tension is a great method of learning. And so Jesus, most scholars believe, is putting the disciples in a situation whereby they would finally realize, I have not only come for you. I want to come to the entire world so that all who are lost might be saved. I didn't come just for the healthy, I came for the sick. I came for those who you believe are so far from God they cannot be reached. Now, how do we take a great story like that, where Jesus is willing to risk wounding someone in order to teach the disciples a lesson that he hopes they will learn for the rest of their lives, that nobody's so far from God that they can't be reached? What's the lesson for us? What are we supposed to know? Jesus says that he's pursuing people that we think are unworthy. He's teaching the disciples that He will pursue those we think are too far from God and cannot be reached. He's telling us that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He didn't come for the healthy, the well. He came for those who are sick. And he will take drastic measures to reach them and to teach his followers, his disciples, that they should be just as passionate about those who are far from God as he was and is. Now, I mentioned a few weeks ago, that I had seen the Jesus Revolution, and it really got me thinking. And if you haven't seen that movie, I really encourage you to see it, because it depicts the great Jesus Revolution that happened in the 60s and 70s. So you have all these young people that are seeking an experience with a transcendent, but God is not something they've considered. In fact, they're casting God out of the public domain. So they turn to drugs and psychedelic experiences. They turn to sex, free love. They turn to all these things. And they identify themselves as hippies, or maybe we identify them as hippies. And suddenly, because one man, one preacher, Chuck Smith, starting right here in Southern California, 
decided that he would invite these hippies into his church, that he recognized that what they're really looking for can be found, everything they're truly looking for can be found in a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ, he invites them in, and as a result, it launches perhaps the greatest Jesus revolution of, of the past hundred years. And people far from God come near to God. And historians, religious sociologists have asked the question, what played the huge or the significant part in this Jesus revolution? Was it the teaching of Chuck Smith? Was it because there was a church willing to embrace a, a generation of young people that other parts of the world refused to invite in? And the conclusion basically is that sex, drugs, and alcohol were simply not working. The idols they were chasing were not delivering Free sex or free love had left them empty. Psychedelic experiences had left them empty and diseased. Rather than giving them life, it had brought them death. And many will suffer disease and death as a result of what happened in the 60s and 70s. So the church opened its doors, kept its doors open for those who had been pursuing something that led to futility. And so here we are again as we ask how this passage relates to our time. And now where are we in our world today? Isn't it just another cycle that we're witnessing? Again, a whole new generation is living. And what do we expect? We here in America, we've taken God out of our schools, the Bible out of our schools. We've locked God out in a closed system. Scientifically, we removed God, even though it makes absolutely no sense. So you've got an entire couple of generations growing up in a world where God is no longer an option. Well, of course they're going to seek something else. Because man cannot live without some kind of spiritual experience, something that he or she can attach themselves to that would give them a meaning or the feeling of transcendence, something of beyond. And if God is no longer an option, typically in the human experience, you're going to turn to things like sex and love and money and power. And of course we have a whole generation of lost people looking for all the right things but in all the wrong areas. And they don't look at the church as a viable option. So as I look at this, I ask a few questions. Two of them emerge. Number one, who are the hippies of our day? Who who do we believe to be the very bottom of the spiritual barrel where if we took an R&R somewhere and we were surrounded and flooded by these people, we would say they are so far from God they cannot be reached. And what would Jesus have to do? What experience would he have to give us to open our eyes to the reality that he came to seek and save the lost? Think about it. What did the hippies of the 60s and 70s during the greatest Jesus revolution believe? Well, let me give you the quote. They believed that the psychedelic experience of drug stupefaction or stupefaction, is a confrontation with the divine. It is a spiritual awakening. You come back from this experience and define God for yourself. You are reborn. Do you notice the Do you notice the similarities in the language between being born again as a Christ follower and being born again through psychedelic experiences? A whole generation in the 60s and 70s were reaching for the transcendent. And when you look around today, and you see all the broken families, and you see all the divorced and the segmented families, and all the promiscuity among the heterosexuals, I mean, we're so quick to talk about the gay, lesbian, and the, uh, the transgender communities. But long before we started talking about that, we had this influx, even among Christ followers, this incredible promis- promiscuity among heterosexuals. Why? And then the the addictions that would follow of alcohol and drugs and gambling and even food itself has become an addiction. And now in this generation, you are finding an entire group of people who are searching for the experience of the transcendent. And if God is no longer an option, if they have been raised in a generation that said God is no longer an option, there is no creator, there is no sustainer, there is nothing beyond to connect with, then you're going to fill that void. You're going to find that significance and meaning through some other savior or pseudo-savior. Remember what Augustine said? Our souls are restless till we find our rest in you. 
Well, if you're restless, you're going to try to find it in other places. And that's the generation in which we are living right now. The hippies of the 60s were the people of Tyre and Sidon of Jesus' day. They also were seeking the transcendent through idol worship. No matter how debaucherous that idol worship became, it is impossible for man to live without God. It is impossible for humanity to live without the transcendent. You're going to find it. You're going to search for it some way. So the question then is this. Remember what happened in the Jesus revolu Revolution. The very bottom of the spiritual barrel, the hippies, the broken, the imprisoned, the torn apart, Chuck Smith, like Jesus, desperately sought to bring them in, but his congregation, like the disciples, wanted to keep them out. It's a repeat of Matthew chapter 15. And the reason they wanted to keep them out is it was inconvenient, it was unnerving, it was confusing, and it felt unsafe. So as you look at the Jesus revolution, as you look at Matthew 15, then who are the hippies of our day? Who do we consider to be too far from God to be reached? The very bottom of the spiritual barrel. That it's impossible to connect them to the transcendent because they're too far gone. Now listen, is sex not the God of this age? One of them. Remember what we read in Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death, that won a Pulitzer, Surprise, a, a Pulitzer Prize. And basically the book said, very, very popular, sold millions of copies. The book said that you can, it, it is easy for us to underestimate what people are willing to do to fill the void now that God is gone. So we live with this overarching sense of death. So we need to connect with the transcendent to know that there's something more than life. And if God is kicked out in a closed system, that means we'll try to find it in other places. So here's this secular humanist telling us that the impact on culture of a no-God world means that there's no hope, no morality, no future. Nothing good can come. And so as we look around our world, should it surprise us that you have people seeking an experience, almost psychedelic, physical psychedelic experience, not in drugs so much anymore, although that's still there, but now in things like homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, they're trying to find, we are trying to find identity. If we have no identity in Christ and we have no identity in God, then we have to find, we have to attach ourselves to something that makes us unique. And when we attach ourselves to something that makes us unique and makes us feel worthy or significant or special, then we will defend that to the death because to let go of it would be to let go of ourselves. And so that should bring compassion. As we have a whole generation addicted to pornography, trying drugs, breaking through the barriers, crossing the lines of sexuality in all kinds of different categories, first started by the heterosexuals in promiscuity. And now here we are. Is it any wonder that we have a generation of people who are so lost, who are looking for answers? One person said, the truth is silent, it's the lies that are always loud. Think about the lies that our youth are hearing every single day. Not only our youth, everyone, young adults, middle-aged, think about the lies that come across through every kind of platform. Should we not at least continue to stand on truth, but to do so with compassion and do exactly what Jesus was trying to teach the disciples to do? Never think that someone is so far that God cannot reach them. Who are the hippies of our day? Jesus never went soft on sin, folks. He always went very hard on self-righteousness. And he went overboard to engage the unrighteous. That's what Matthew 15 is about. And if we had a... What, what if we hung a sign out in our our entryways into our church that said, we hate divorced people. We hate promiscuous people. We hate adulterers. We hate gays and lesbians and transgendered. 
You say, Jeff, we would never do that. Okay, that might be true. But if the attitude exists on the inside, we might as well hang a sign over the doorpost. So again, the question is, who in our culture is desperately searching for a spiritual awakening, a confrontation with the divine, an identity that is unique and defining? Again, are we not in our own sexual revolution at this time in history? Are we not crossing boundaries in a way we never have before? And are these boundaries not leading not to life, the life they promised, but to death, to suicide and ultimate brokenness? But Jesus teaches us in Matthew 15 that Christianity is an invitation to the broken, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, Luke nineteen ten. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, Mark chapter 2, verse 17. So who are the hippies of our time? And second, how shall they hear without a preacher? In a definitive moment in the movie, The Jesus Revolution, Lonnie comes to Chuck Smith, the pastor, regarding the hippies, because Chuck Smith, the pastor, doesn't know what to do with this group. And I quote, Lonnie says this, he says, I know we, referring to the hippies, must seem pretty strange to you, but if you look a little deeper with love, you will see a bunch of kids who are searching for all the right things, just in all the wrong places. They are sheep without a shepherd, chasing hard after the lies, and the trouble is, you people reject them. So I ask you, pastor, how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? We can only walk through doors open to us and your church, well, that door is shut. Man, I heard that when I was watching the movie. And I thought, is that what we've done? Have we told people, if you behave a certain way and believe a certain way, we'll let you come in and listen to the gospel. But then they wouldn't need the gospel. So Chuck Smith invites them to church and man, do they seem out of the place when they come in. They're hippies. They're in hippie dress. you got all these people on the left side of the church that are conservative, dressed in suit and ties, and everybody on the right side of the church because they're not seated together. All the hippies are no shoes. <laughs> they're not certain what to do. It's the first time that most of them had ever been to church. One of the head elders in Chuck Smith's church says they don't belong here. They're staining the new shag carpet with their bare feet. And Pastor Smith says, oh, well, now let's be sure to save that carpet. He's got a greater mission. He's trying to save a generation of youth. And what does he do? The next weekend, he meets all the hippies at the front door and washes all their feet, literally washes their feet before they come in to give a direct message to the elders. Smith realizes along the way, this generation is listening and they've got so many voices crashing in on them. What hope do they have? And finally, the pastor, Chuck Smith, gets on stage and he looks out over to the hippies and he looks at them and he says, this place is yours. If you feel you're an outcast, join us here. If you feel misunderstood and judged, this is where you belong. If you feel ashamed, trapped, here you will find forgiveness. The door is open all of the time for you. And that's when Lonnie reaches forward to the pastor, Lonnie the hippie, and says, Pastor, you're going to need a lot bigger church. And he was right. And Time Magazine in 1971 wrote an article on the Jesus Revolution out here in Southern California. And it said, Jesus is alive and well, living in the radical spiritual fervor of a growing number of young Americans who have proclaimed an extraordinary religious revolution in Jesus' name. Now listen, I've just got a few minutes here. Can I tell you something? The time is going to come. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next year, although it could be both. The time is coming when this generation, of all the voices they've listened to and all the things that they've tried, many of them are going to come to the conclusion that it's not working. And if the church kept its doors open to those who are far from God, I'm telling you, the prodigals will come home. Now, not every hippie in the 60s and 70s became part of the Jesus Revolution. I would argue that most did not. There's always going to be the militant few. And there's always going to be those who reject or refuse. But if the church does what Jesus says we should do, 
to believe that no one is so far from God that they cannot be reached. And if the church opens its doors to all sinners, then at one point, the prodigals will return home. I think that although we talk a really good game about wanting to seek those who are far from God, that when it comes right down to it, we're afraid. And so I want to end the message by dealing, we've dealt with the Matthew 15 passage before, but I want to deal with something very practical because when I preach a message like this, here are some of the things I hear, okay? So I want to put your mind at ease. By going after people, all people who are far from God, let me tell you what it does not mean. Number one, it does not mean that we will water down the gospel to make sure we offend no one. We're not going to do that because the gospel is offensive. It's going to contradict everyone at some point. But when you approach the gospel from a we perspective rather than a you perspective, the power of grace comes shining through. When there's no self-righteousness and everybody recognizes that we're all sinners striving, striving, that striving is compelling. When we, when we acknowledge that we're all sinners struggling with something, we're all sinners saved by grace, we're trying to be holy as God is holy. We're trying to resist the devil in order that he might flee. We're trying to say no to the desires of the flesh and walk daily in the Spirit. We've, we're trying to die continually to our old man to be resurrected and live as an, in a new way of life. We're always dragging, we are, dragging our feelings and emotions, no matter what we feel, to the objective truth of God's Word. And we fail along the way but we keep getting back up and striving. Remember what Paul said in Philippians? And here's the, here's the, here's the dude who wrote one-third of the New Testament. He said, I haven't already obtained it. I haven't arrived at the goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Here's one thing I do. I forget what lies behind. I have to. I strain toward what is ahead, and I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So, we will never compromise the truth of Scripture because therein lies eternal and abundant life. I don't want you to think that suddenly we're going to start teaching a shallower gospel. No. The gospel is the only thing that has the power to transform us from the inside out. We're just simply saying that there will be people who come into our midst that don't have the history we have. Think about it. Think, think about this for a second. I've got a friend uh, that works here at the church that decided he was going to take a sabbatical, so he decided to spend a week at a monastery. Now, one of the things he said is that it just about killed him because they're vegetarians. So he ate beans and rice all week. He didn't know that was going to happen. Beans and rice and Jesus Christ, he said. The other thing is, he didn't know when to stand up, when to sit down, when to pray, when to talk, when to not talk. So he goes in very nervous of what to do so as not to offend. Imagine people, we're in a whole new generation, listen, there's a game called uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Very popular game. There's an app. I downloaded it on my phone because I like playing it. Because it, it, it tests your knowledge of, of various fields. And I like to see how much knowledge do I have and how, how high can I climb and what can I learn new? Because when you miss a question, they give you the answer. No, I know that now. Every time I'm playing that game, I know if there's a Bible question, winner, winner, chicken dinner. I'm always going to win because you always play against somebody else around the world. You don't know who they are. They just have an identifying mark. I am surprised at the lack of Bible knowledge in our world. I mean, simple questions. Who built an ark? And they miss it. On what did Jesus walk? And they'll give you four silly things like water, a plank. You know, come on. It may, it's made me realize the lack of knowledge and understanding of the Scripture and of Christianity and of church. So that means there will be people coming into our midst if we're really an invitational kind of people that all who are far from God, that one and all are really welcome. It means that people are going to come in here, they don't know what to do. They don't mean to be offensive. You think about, it. let's say you have a daughter and your daughter is struggling with her gender. So she dresses up as a man or a, a, a guy, and she walks into church. How, if that's your daughter, how do you want her to be treated? Do you want somebody to come up to her and just preach to her and kick her out? Or do you want somebody to put their arms around her? Hey, you're welcome here. Come, sit with us, and listen to the message of the gospel. You with me? 
See, it gets messy. It gets uncomfortable. But Jesus goes to such drastic measures to get this through the heads of the disciples. They need remedial help. And I'm telling you, the church of today needs remedial help too. But it doesn't mean that we're going to water down the gospel. We would never do that. We will always preach the truth of God's Word, but we will do it from a position of grace. And we will talk about we, not you. We have this problem. We have these temptations. We have these struggles. Let's be all in together. And second, it doesn't mean that we'll refuse to teach what is appropriate in the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. You know, when you go to the golf club, there are people who join the club and they start playing golf and they leave their shirts out. Now, I don't know why this is a rule, but it is. So when you play golf at the club, you have to tuck your shirt in. And I'll see the manager or the pro oftentimes come to the driving range and say, young man, I know you're new here, but you need to tuck your shirt in. If you go to a Laker game, and let's say you want to go down on the court and talk to LeBron James, if you do that, they'll kick you out of the stadium. If you go to an Angels game, it's important that you identify as a loser. That's a little joke there. The point is that everything has rules. Everything has something that is appropriate, inappropriate. But you teach these things from a position of love. What if you've never been in the house of the Lord and you do something that's out of character? Then we put our arms around people and we teach them. We teach them. Let me tell you, when I first came to this church, I had my own culture shock back in 2008. During communion time, I would notice that everybody in the audience was taking communion. Even like three and four-year-olds, were, moms were giving it to their little children. People who did not yet know Jesus were taking communion. Now, I could have stood up and said, you evil, bad people, this is a holy sacrament and you're abusing it. Or do you teach and say, okay, let me explain what communion is, who it's for, according to Scripture, and you do it from a position of love. I'm just simply trying to remind us that if we really have the heart for people who are far from God as Jesus had the heart for people far from God, then everybody will be welcome here. And I mean everybody. We might have to do some teaching. We might have to do some explaining. But everybody's welcome. And just because we reach after those the world is considered beneath the lowest of the low, at the bottom of the spiritual barrel. It will never mean that we will water down the gospel because the gospel is the transformational power that changes lives. And it doesn't mean that we will not teach what's appropriate in the house of the Lord. We will with patience and grace. And third and finally, the end, it does not mean that the service somehow caters because this is what I hear. Well, if, if that happens, that means all your sermons are going to be the same and you're going to cater to the lowest common denominator. Well, that's ridiculous. The truths of the Word of God are profound, and we will deal with them in a profound way. We will not K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. That's not what we will do. But we will always, every week, make a beeline for the gospel so that the gospel is clearly communicated in simple terms so that those far from God might come near. I love, I love it when Chuck Smith says, this place, it is yours. If you feel you're an outcast, join us here. If you feel misunderstood and judged, this is where you belong. If you feel ashamed, trapped, here you will find forgiveness. The door is open all the time. And may they say about our church one day, Jesus is alive and well, living in a radical spiritual fervor of the growing number of young Americans who have proclaimed an extraordinary religious revolution in his name. Matthew 15, 21, and the story of how Jesus deals with a Canaanite woman pumps me up. And you know why? It fires me up because it reminds me again that we're not to be a holy huddle. We're not to live in seclusion that we're supposed to go out into the highways and byways and bring them in and welcome them in. Even the people we think are so far gone because the transformational power of the Spirit of God and the good news of the gospel changes lives, rescues families, heals community. And I say it again, what I've said many times before, the only hope I know of for this world is Jesus Christ and His church moving effectively out into the world. 
Father, I thank you and praise you for Matthew 15, and I pray that our eyes would have been opened and our hearts would have been melted, and we would recognize that we too are sinners, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, so that we too would sacrifice for those who do not yet know you, that those far from God may come near. In Christ's name, amen.